Tom here from Lauren Systems, and I am with John Todd, the Executive Director over at Quad9. And we're going to talk about what is Quad9. It's uh, maybe not what you think it is. I've been learning a lot more myself about it. And uh, we're going to dive into like the DNS filtering and some of the goods and bads and all the details behind it. So welcome, John. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it was thanks fun. It, it was yeah. great. This all started because I started doing some DNS uh you know, putting the DNS to the test, uh, which is uh, turns out to be not insurmountable, but certainly a difficult task. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you responded as long as as well as a few other people. So it's been kind of just uh, a lot of discussion. And you joined my forums, and uh, we're helping people out, which I thought was really cool. And then that led to uh, you coming on here, so we can talk. You know, throw a video together talking more about the whole DNS filtering. Yeah, DNS is, a, of course, from my perspective, it's a really interesting topic. It's, it's a very active place right now from um, both a technical level, meaning the changes that are occurring in DNS, and also from a policy level, um, like what is it that we're doing with the DNS and how does it work and how is encryption and filtering and, and in some places censorship um, really going to change, uh, in my opinion, change this kind of the structure of the internet fundamentally. Um, um, so it's an interesting place to be right now. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if the names have to resolve or we don't know where anything is. I mean, Google Points is somewhere, but then, it, you know, the whole process after Google Points is to wherever we're going or DuckDuckGo or whatever your search engine of choice is. And of course, the uh, ISPs have been fighting this whole DNS encryption thing. But before we dive into that, let's talk a little bit about Quad9. Sure, what is Quad9? Sure. So, so Quad9 is a not-for-profit uh, 501c3. We're based in Berkeley, California, although staff is everywhere. Of course, everything is virtual these days, and these days even more virtual than most. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, we were founded in wow, 2016, um, uh, kind of as a, the, the, I'll distill the story as quickly as I can. Um, an organization, another, another not-for-profit called Global Cyber Alliance based out of New York, um, is their job is to make as much of a dent in the cybersecurity space as they can for as little money as possible, as all nonprofits have. You know, there's, there's a funding yeah. limitation. So they, um, uh, law enforcement agencies and the DA of New York and City of London Police, uh, their cybersecurity, of course, is a an, is an constant thorn in the side of these organizations because of the amount of money that it costs their constituents, right? If you, especially New York, where the financial organizations are in the city of London, again, finance, those organizations said to GCA, you know, we're, we're, we're losing a lot of money on um, cybersecurity. Here's a grant, go do something about cybersecurity. We don't care what, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and in fact, multiple projects uh, came out of this. But one of the things that GCA then said was, you know, DNS filtering seems like a very inexpensive and easy way to take a chunk out of cybersecurity issues. They weren't, however, really an, an operational organization at that time. So they came to another not-for-profit uh, called Packet Clearinghouse based in Berkeley. PCH has been around for about 25 years. They're the biggest DNS service provider you've never heard of. Um, because they're not-for-profit, they have no advertising budget. But PCH runs infrastructure in... Uh, 160 or so locations. I actually don't know what the, the count is off the top of my head. I'm ashamed to say. Um, mostly at IX locations, inner exchanges around the world. Um, they operate um, name servers that serve a lot of the TLDs, like more than 100 country codes use PCH as their, uh, basically their outsourced um, DNS hosting. Also, there's some very large DNS zones in PCH. Um, two of the 13 root name servers do uh, any cast through PCH. Um, so PCH is a very large organization with a huge footprint and basically a lot of DNS experience. I work for PCH. GCA came to PCH and said, you know, we want to do this DNS filtering thing. Do you have any experience with it? And it just so happens that yes, PCH had done some other DNS resolver architectures. Um, so took the project on. Um, and then very quickly, I was given the project as the project manager, essentially. And we determined very quickly that the... Quad9, at that point it wasn't called Quad9, it was just the DNS resolver, um, needed a couple of things. The first thing it needed was a very memorable IP address to be used because we saw the success, frankly, of Google's 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. You know, people can remember yeah. that and they can put it in. So Four of the same numbers, really easy. <laughs> it, it is. Um, so we, we firstly, we needed a, a memorable number. Second is that we needed, we needed this to be an independent organization that was as far away from... Um, uh, control by other organizations as we could get. 
And this was because we, we correctly perceived that privacy was going to be one of the biggest things that we had to offer. So we founded the organization. We created a new not-for-profit that was not part of Global Cyber Alliance. It was not part of PCH. It's, it's got its own board um, and its own employees and its own money. Um, and so then we were left looking for that IP address. It just so happened that uh, timing was really good. Um, I ended up reaching out to some folks and actually other people at PCH ended up reaching out to some folks at IBM uh, and saying, you know, you, hey, you've got nine slash eight. You've got one 256th of the IPv4 space in the world and you're not really announcing any of it. Would you be interested in participating in this project uh, and donating 9.9.9.0 slash 24? And it just so turned out that IBM was considering like how do we get into DNS resolution because we have this interesting IP address, but they recognize that, that again, trust and privacy were key components of this and that they probably wouldn't be able to offer uh, a service under their own brand because you know, it's, it's, it would be a, seen as a commercial service. Yeah, and the shareholders would be interested in monetizing it. Right, exactly. And also that there are risks involved in it. I, you know, IBM doesn't necessarily want to have an open resolver attached to them. So, so there was a, there was a push pull there within their organization, but we found some very um, surprisingly clueful people inside of IBM who really pushed hard for us. And after a long process of lots of lawyers, they donated, meaning that they've, they've since given us the address space of 9990 slash 24, um, which is different than, than um, swipping it to us, meaning that they've actually, it's actually ours now we own it. Oh, okay. Um, and so, uh, they also then entered into as one of our three foundational partners. So Packet Clearinghouse, Global Cyber Alliance, and IBM all put in either funding, um, uh, uh, real assets such as the address space, um, or in pa Packet Clearinghouse's case, they've put in a huge amount of resources in allowing our servers to be distributed worldwide. So um, that's what Quad9 is. We were founded in 2016, and since we've, we've gone on to be, become uh, quite large uh, from a footprint perspective, um, uh, but we are still fairly small from an organizational perspective. I mean, there's really only, there's, there's a handful of people working on this, but because of the use of open source, um, we're, we're entirely open source based, um, and also because of PCH's great footprint, we punch well above our weight. Um, and um, so we are on a par with any of the other large global resolvers, um, despite our size and our, uh, our much diminished funding as compared to the billion dollar companies that are running these other systems. Um, and so uh, the, key prim the key focus with, with Quad9 is twofold. One is privacy. Um, we don't have a shareholder uh, to answer to. So we're not monetizing users' DNS queries. We are essentially never recording anything about the IP address of end users. It's immediately discarded. We never write it to disk. We never transmit it out of the location in which it's received. So privacy is key. And then, of course, the security component of it, which was the core foundational reason for it, which is that we get a block list and apply that to the DNS queries if you use our 999 service and associated secondaries. Um, so if you try to go to a malicious site, phishing, botnet command and control, spyware, there's a whole host of things that we block. If you are, uh, if one of our threat intelligence providers has given us that domain, we will prevent you from going to it, which is very, very appealing for uh, home users, uh, small business, um, and organizations who would typically have a diff difficult time or could not afford a, uh, to implement a uh, filtering system that's a much deeper platform, like doing a firewall with deep packet inspection or URL filtering or things like that. So. We're very and, effective, very cheap, uh, free. <laughs> well, that was uh, the conclusion yeah. from my DNS filtering that I really came to was uh, that of all the services and some of them being paid, and I was set up some trials of them, uh, Quad9 was consistently performing quite a bit better in terms of uh, you know sinkholing more and more of the bad sites. Yeah. And that was the narrow, narrower scope of my test. And I thought that was really impressive and it kind of made me go, well, how good is this? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so it's impressive. Uh, that's really due to um, our threat intelligence providers. Um, Quad9 itself, uh, we are, you know, if you want to use the analogy, we're, we're simply a, uh, looking at the power grid, right? We're just the wires that take the power from the generator to the end user. So we don't actually generate this block list. We don't, we're not in the filtering or analytics business. Um, 
So we have around 19 different threat intelligence providers, of course, including IBM, but many others, Domain Tools, Mnemonic, ThreatStop, Threat Connect. I mean, it's a very long list, yeah. um, including some open source ones, but many of them are closed. Um, they provide us these lists of domains and we block on them. And because it's this, this widely diverging set of companies and sources that are giving us the list, we cover a, a, a lot more than most other, um, most other DNS-based block list providers do. And so the next question people have for me is typically, well, why do these threat providers give you this data, this really valuable data for free? Um, so what we give back to the threat intelligence providers is we give them some volumetric data on their blocks, which it's very difficult for them to get otherwise. So if they give us a domain, um, you know, you know, baddomain.com, we distribute it across, across all of our systems. And then anytime someone tries to go and connect to one of those hosts in baddomain.com, we don't give back any information about the end user, but we do actually send them a note that says, hey, someone tried to get to this domain. Um, and they, they only get information about domains they give us. So they don't get anything about you know, random domains. They only get us information about the domains they give us. And there's a very long set of criteria of like what you're allowed to put in the block list. Um, and it can only be malicious. It's only going to be for um, blocking purposes. It can't be for marketing or tracking or anything else. So there's a, there's a document everyone signs to that extent. Um, but that volumetric data is super useful to them because it allows them to figure out which domains are actually active, which ones are ramping up, which ones are ramping down. Um, and so they find that is useful to their paying customers. Now, how they you know, how they filter that and massage it and give it to their paying customers is up to them. We're happy if they're making money, we're getting the threat data. And then in turn, we get an improved set of threat data from them because of this feedback loop. Um, so it works out for everybody. Um, there's no data privacy that's violated. And uh, we hopefully make the internet a safer place, not just for our users, but for the users of any of our threat intelligence partners downstream who are using more advanced components of those solutions. And that's fine as far as we're concerned. So that, that's really that's a, kind of how it works. I really like it. That's a good method. And I like that, you know, when you started out, you talk about being a nonprofit and I think we're going to probably start seeing if you, if a company or a group of, individu group of individuals really wants to say, I want to make a privacy oriented product and I want to give it away in some way immediately. Your first thought is you're going to monetize my existence. Yep. So by establishing a nonprofit, I think is an important step that kind of allows everything else because you have strict policies not to try to monetize it in that way. Yep. Um, I've always liked the uh, Boxy Marlin Spikes work on the signal messenger for that. You know, he set it up and structure it in a nonprofit and they go, look, we don't have data. We rely on donations. So I'm not trying to sell your existence or some knowledge of your existence that, yep. you know, can be uh, quantified. So it's a, I, really clever. It's just a yep. good way and good structure and uh, yep. gives you a lot more confidence in a product. Yeah. So we, we get um, the, the bulk of our funding comes still from um, people like IBM, corporate sponsors who are, who are find that that threat enrichment model is extremely useful to them. Um, and of course we do get donations from end users. Thanks for plugging us on your site. We've, oh, we actually, yeah. I had some specific, you know, Hey, this was because of the, the threat analytics that, uh, that was done by, by you, um, but we're really actually we're 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 tragically underfunded as most nonprofits are, <laughs> um, and so what we're really shooting to do is we're trying to find, we're trying to challenge the original organizations who we benefit the most. You know, financial uh, banks, right? Um, electronic payment companies, um, uh, email providers, all of these people benefit from the blocks that we provide and have real num real money associated with it. I mean, in the millions of dollars per day um, that we're preventing, but it's very difficult to get in front of the decision makers and actually prove out like, how is Quad9 benefiting your organization right now? And we do, um, but it's, it's a difficult process getting, you know, that's a very broad set of people to have to go after. So um, that's one of our biggest challenges is finding out how do we incre increase our funding pipelines so that we're not, uh, we're not always relying on, on a trickle of funds that, we're, that we have and, today. And as you go outside the tech space, that only, uh, like you said, the banking and financial institutions, that only becomes more difficult because their wow, core competency tough. isn't technology. Their yes. core competency is running a bank, running a yes. financial institution. So they don't, quad nine, what does that mean? Like that yeah. doesn't, and be, that's before you even got to the, what's a DNS and why do I care? <laughs> exactly. But, but they recognize that they're losing, you know, 
thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars due to cybersecurity issues, not just for themselves, not, you know, ju not just affecting their businesses where their business might have a breach, but their users are being defrauded. And that's, that's you know, looping back into them. Credit card fraud is a massive yep. one that we prevent. So um, I appeal to, your, to anybody watching this, if you are with one of these organizations, put me in touch with your CISO. I'm, I, you know, how, can we, how can we work together? And, and so the, the term viral is often overused. We, we kind of do have a viral effect, meaning that if your organization sponsors Quad9, we are happy to take blocks that are specific to your organization. So if you're a bank, as an example, and we do this actually right now for several financial institutions, if they give us a block of all the domains that they know are trying to defraud them, that are phishing domains that's, that are lookalikes, right? We will protect any users on our service from those domains. So then it becomes in their, their, to their benefit yeah. to promote Quad9 to their user base. So like, hey, if you wanna, if you wanna not be defrauded for your credit cards, um, use Quad9, we give them data specifically to prevent fraud on the credit card that we know you're a user of. So um, th there's kind of a, again, there's a, a, a roll up th that occurs there. And so this is what it's contributed to, um, was well, one of the things that's contributed to Quad9's growth. Um, you know, we, up until the COVID uh, restrictions, we were growing at about 3% per week. Um, uh, which was a pretty astonishing and scary number. Uh, interestingly, in the last three months or so, that number that that has stabilized. We're actually kind of flat. Although in the last in the last week, we've actually started growing again, probably because people are going back to work. Yeah. But the uh, people, when they're making uh, businesses, schools, small governments, agencies, you know, they they uh, tend to use Quad Nine because of the free cybersecurity benefits. So we find there's much more traction there where one person can make a decision to change the DNS resolver in the DHCP server, you know, at the secondary school, right? So one person's decision can influence a thousand users. Whereas if we're talking individual users at home, which is where, where most people have been for the last three months, um, we have to talk to each and every person. We have to convince each and every person to make that conversion so that the, the rate of growth is slower if we look at end user growth. Our rate of growth is huge if you look at um, you know small small enterprise small government kind of deployments. Um, that's where that's where the decision making happens. We're like, well, why wouldn't we use Quad9? It's free. It's private. The the DNS queries are going to a server that's only you know 50 kilometers away. Why wouldn't we do that? So that's where we get the most growth. Um, anyway, sorry, diverging off of our topic, which was encryption oh. and security. I'm going. Oh, we'll to get there. I, I think laying it down <laughs> of why you know because. Uh, it kind of goes hand in hand. If we don't talk about why you should use Quad9 or who Quad9 is, why should I bother encrypting if I'm handing to someone I don't trust? I, I think right. that's a really right. important piece of the groundwork that has to be laid. Right. You can't just throw it at anyone like, hey, I encrypt it and I hid it from my uh, ISP that I don't trust. But oh yeah, by the way, I gave it to the other people and they're like, <laughs> they're in cahoots with them and so it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yep. Yep. So on to the next topic uh, and where we're kind of heading with this is the DNS encryption. So yeah. how should I encrypt my DNS? Fascinating, fascinating work being done in there right now. So um, DNS is kind of the last frontier, as I call it, of unencrypted data. Um, almost everything else on the internet has gone encrypted over the last five years or seven years. Um, HTTPS, of course, you know, Let's Encrypt has really done a sea change yep. there. Kudos to them. But, you know, email is primarily encrypted now. Uh, of course, most web traffic is encrypted. Pretty much everything you look at has got a TLS layer on it of some sort. Um, so DNS was the last frontier for not being encrypted. Um, and so obviously that needs to change because metadata is almost as useful as seeing the data itself. Um, you, can, you can infer an enormous amount about uh, an individual or even about clusters of individuals if you see all of their DNS data. Uh, especially seeing DNS data in sequence where you see, you know, a certain query to a certain domain followed by another domain followed by another domain. You can infer that it's either a specific web page being, being viewed um, because, you know, there are signatures. If you look at the DNS data for web pages, you'll for, you know, the top banner ad is served by this company. The first image is served by this part CDN. The second image is served by this. You know, in other words, you can, you can fingerprint websites just by the DNS queries they do. Um, but you can also just fingerprint what people are doing by looking at the general DNS. 
So I think there's a, another side that's interesting because um, it's we always have self-reporting stats from you know different websites, but the, through the DNS data, if you have enough of it, you would actually have a much better idea exactly how popular yes. that website really is. Not self-reported, but you'd be able to see these websites are this popular. Um, and if you combine that with knowing where they're coming from, now you can see what trend, right? All these people in Detroit, Michigan, where I am, seem to really like this website over yep. here, and they go there during this time of the day. So you get, yep. like you said, through the metadata, uh, an enormous amount of insight into behaviors. Very interesting stuff. And, and uh, yeah, very interesting stuff. Um, so metadata is just as important. DNS has been the last unencrypted model. So because it's unencrypted, there are several parties who are interested in that. Um, the first... Um, is and possibly the least um, uh, the least scary, although depending on your perspective, is our advertisers. And so advertisers are interested in what you're doing so they can model um, advertisements to you, or at least so they can profile you from a demographic perspective. Um, uh, that might be the most scary, depending on, <laughs> depending on who you ask. They seem um, to know exactly what I want. It's, it's, a little, it's yeah. offsetting, it's off-putting yep. for sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, if you're giving your DNS to an advertising company, you might consider that that ultimately is counterproductive to your privacy. Um, de depends on what the privacy, you know, everyone has different privacy um, statements and goals and, and um, wording on their, on their formulas, but you, you um, it's, it's really kind of a question of principle. You know, who, are, who is it that you're gonna give your DNS to? Um, so, and it's not just giving your DNS. There have been, there have definitely been cases where advertisers not simply are the recipient of DNS queries as a, as a resolver, but where actually ISPs are tapping DNS and selling that to advertisers as, oh, whether directly or indirectly, meaning that they might be selling it to a DNS a passive DNS company, which then repackages that and sells it to an advertiser. There's, there's all kinds of indirection that can occur in that stack. Um, so so you're, you're defending really against three different, with encryption you're defending against three different participants in the, in the stack. One is the local, um, of course, you know, the local intercept, which or actually local intercept and rewrite so you're sitting in a cafe using Wi-Fi. You're trying to protect yourself against somebody from seeing that traffic very close to you um, on an uncontrolled network, um, or even maybe a, a malicious device on your trusted network. Seeing the DNS um, replying back before the DNS, the remote DNS server is, and trying to redirect your traffic to go to somewhere else, or in just intercepting and looking at it. So both interception and rewrite are very important topics on the local component, um, meaning in your local network. Um, or even in some cases, even on the local client. Um, so there's, there's malware, which will try to do those tricks yeah. on your local service uh, or your local, your local machine. Um, so the second layer is your ISP or your, your, your trusted um, transit provider, whoever that may be. Um, you know, some, the chances are low that they will do rewrite um, on just the raw packets. Um, but they might, you know, so there are certain countries where that happens. Um, that's for sure. Like uh, if you're in China, um, you're, you know, there are certain laws restricting what you can do with DNS on the local ISP and there'll be rewrites occurring um, uh, or, or blocks occurring locally. Um, so that's important. Um, and then often, um, often the, the, that second layer, your transit provider, meaning your ISP, and your DNS provider will be the same organization. So who you actually send your DNS queries to, like what, what is the IP address to which your DNS queries are, are being sent, is the third place where you've got to kind of look out for and defend your privacy and your security. Um, but as I said, looking at the statistics in general uh, in, uh, worldwide, um, the vast majority of people do not use an over-the-top DNS provider um, or an, like like Quad9 or, or Google or Cisco. They use whatever their 
internet provider, uh, their transport right. layer get handed yes. over to them. Yep. Uh, one thing I will notice, I remember it's been a few years since I've seen this, but some of the cable providers uh, had made the decision to block uh, torrenting sites and things like that. And yes. they just sync hold the search engines and things like that. So there's sometimes yep. some levels of filtering they may do uh, because it's, you know, they don't want that traffic on their network. They don't want you sure. uh, potentially pirating movies. Yep. <laughs> Maybe they yeah, have their well, own interests. So there's another layer that does occur is sometimes they do filter at least some pieces of it. Yep. You could argue that that's legitimate because they right. have terms of service. You've signed the terms of service. They, you know, you have a contractual relationship with them. And so you have some recourse. Um, I, I think that both contractual and legal issues are a difficult one to address because you've somehow you've, you've, you, you're in the jurisdiction of those contracts or legal <laughs> legal yes. arrangements, right? So you kind of have to comply. And if you don't like it, you can complain or vote or whatever. Um, so uh, there's also things like um, there were certain providers, uh, certain ISPs for quite some time. In fact, I've, some of them may still do it. I want to say that Level 3's Open Resolver did this, that if you went to an NX domain, meaning a, a non-existent domain, they would redirect you to a search engine or, you know, oh, to yeah. their advertisements, yep. which is, you know, most people would describe that as unexpected. Um, and so that's another kind of problem that people have to surmount. Maybe, maybe there's some person somewhere that thinks that's a great thing, but I, I know I don't. And I think yeah. most people would just, would, I, would, I'd rather have it not resolve and fail versus uh, land me on some, especially because those ad sites to, you know, the less tax savvy people look like something that might be legit, look like something they might be to click on. And yeah they're not necessarily always dangerous, but usually full of junk. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, they're exactly. not necessarily good. So, and, and I don't think enough people learn from, you know, the great, the great network solutions disaster from many, many years <laughs> ago when network solutions decided to, you know, use .com and start referencing everything that wasn't a domain to a, their advertising page. Like that's still, that still is a thing some places where they'll direct you to advertising. But anyway, we're kind of getting off the, yeah. off the track that the, the, the encryption uh, needs to occur to kind of prevent uh, these, to prevent unexpected observation or uh, redirection of your queries or non-contractual or non-legal redirection and observation of your queries. Um, and, uh, and, and there are three methods recently, well, actually there's two methods recently and one method that's been around for a while. The first real DNS encryption method is called DNScrypt. And um, DNScrypt is actually a pretty awesome protocol that has not received a lot of love. Uh, it never did get ratified, or I don't even, I'm not even sure if it was submitted as an RFC draft. I don't remember, I should know this off the top of my head, but I don't. <laughs> but they, it never went anywhere, um, despite the fact that it was pretty nice, and, and it really hasn't seen much development in quite some time, which means that it's, it's getting kind of crufty. Um, there are a lot of new extensions to the DNS which are quite useful and quite um, functional which uh, have not been extended into DNS crypt, which is a shame because um, it, it runs over UDP. Uh, it's very fast, it's fairly lightweight, um, but DNS crypt is just not, it doesn't have a lot of legs right now. Um, we support DNS crypt, by the way. It's, it's one of the three different protocols we support. Oh, great. Um, and there are some Linux-based toolkits out there that support it and you can run them on your Mac and Windows and others. Um, so yeah, take a look at it. Um, the second to come out with, uh, with ratification was DNS over TLS, DOT. Um, and this operates on a different port than DNS. DNS typically operates on port 53 um, and uh, DOT operates on port 853. And so that makes DOT uh, identifiable. DOT is all TCP, it's not, it's not UDP. Um, we like DOT um, because for, for actually the, for the fact that it's identifiable, it's possible to identify. You can't see what's in the traffic, but you can see that it is DOT traffic. Um, and I'll get into why that's a good thing here in a, in a much longer part of this conversation. Um, and then the last one to come around is actually DOH, DNS over HTTPS. Um, uh, and that kind of took the world by storm really because uh, it could be implemented inside of applications, which is a terrifying concept in itself, but it made it so that it was easy to deploy inside of browsers and also inside of pretty much anything that already has an HTTP stack. Uh, so applications now can do DNS queries instead of relying on the, the what's called the stub resolver that's located inside your operating system. Usually the application would hand the, 
the request to the stub resolver and then the stub resolver would hand it to the DNS resolver, wherever that happened to be. Um, <clears throat> so now you have applications making the decision on where they're gonna send DNS requests, potentially different uh, destinations from where the operating system is sending them, um, which is a problematic uh, troubleshooting issue. Um, <laughs> so those are the three, uh, in very rough terms, the three different protocols that exist, DNS over HTTPS, DNS over TLS, and DNS crypt. Um, they all have slightly different encryption methodologies, but th they are, they all provide a relatively similar protection against interception and, uh, and rewrite between the client and the DNS resolver, wherever that happens to be located in the network. The, you know, I'll, I'll take a side trip here and say that it's a moot point um, to, to talk about any of these encryption methods at all, uh, depending on where your DNS resolver sits. Um, we actually encourage people to run their own recursive resolver, or actually we, we encourage people to run a forwarding resolver that sends queries to quad nine, but we're also not opposed to people running their own uh, recursive resolvers either. We, again, because we're not trying to capture all the DNS in the world, if you want to run your own resolver, that's great by us. You know, more, more um, independent resolvers out there, the more stable things are. Anyway, um, right now encryption covers that last leg between the client and the resolver, the re whether it's a forwarding resolver or a true recursive resolver, which is which goes all the way down and does all the DNS queries to the root, um, uh, you're really only protecting that last leg. So you have to look at where are the risks in your network? Um, and are the risks between the client and the resolver? Are the risks between the forwarding resolver and the next forwarding resolver? Um, are the risks between your recursive resolver and the authoritative resolvers? So um, uh, if you're running your own recursives, you really, it's good to have, it, encryption is always good, so don't get me wrong, but where's your risk? And then figure out where you need to put encryption in your network to defend against that risk. Um, so DOT, DOH, and DNS crypt are all between stubs and recursive forwarders or, or servers. And uh, that doesn't cover the DNS between the recursive resolver and the authoritatives. Those are unencrypted still. So that is a, <laughs> um, you know, that, that's the challenge that, that right now the DNS community is facing is that, all right, we've got the client encryption done, sort of. I mean, at least we have three yeah. different protocols. So it's one, of, one or all of those will continue to be used. So now we've got to figure out how we encrypt the queries between the recursive resolver and the authoritatives. And that's being actively worked on. Um, I expect some answers in that area of coming into the ITF and, and being seriously considered within the next six to eight months, maybe sooner. There are already some prototypes out there for doing it. Um, Facebook is running a DOT server on their authoritatives, but it's kind of hard coded. There's no discovery mechanism. It's this, you know, if you know that you're going to this domain, then you should encrypt using DOT. So it's anyway, a, sorry. no, it's a challenge getting them all to agree. I think yes. that's the part people don't realize is large companies and they'll have their own opinion. They'll say, well, we're big, we're Facebook, we'll do it this way and everyone else should do it this way or Google may have the same answer, but it may not be the same as Facebook's. Uh, so getting that type of information, um, it's so, I, and he's been on a channel before. So my friend is one of the engineers at Let's Encrypt and they've talked about the challenges just in getting people to agree on certificate transparency yes. and uh, how how it doesn't sound like it'd be hard, but then the politics of companies trying to get them all to agree of this is the way we do, this is the way you do a transparency server so you can see who's getting issued things. Sounds easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. That's uh, the, the good news is that the, in the DNS community, it's, it's actually rather small. The DNS community is not big and everybody recognizes the problem. And um, there are certain things which I think will get quick adoption. There are only maybe four or five DNS software packages out there with, with any significant traction. And, uh, you know, it's, it's ISC bind and powered DNS, knots, uh, the knot resolver, unbound. Um, Go DNS is starting to pick up some traction, which is good. There are a couple of commercial projects, you know, Microsoft has a resolver, um, but it's, it's a relatively small community and everybody knows everybody. And so when things like DOT, when everyone finally agrees on this is the standard, I think we'll see rapid adoption between recursive and authoritatives. Again, the, looking at the 
DNS is an interesting uh, graph to look at. Uh, Jeff Huston at, at AP NIC has done some interesting research on like where do, what, what are the largest, world's largest DNS recursive resolvers and where do they live? And you know, the vast majority of the world's query traffic comes from a very small number of organizations. Um, and you can, you know, the obvious ones are the big cable companies, um, the big Indian and Chinese ISPs, you know, where a single organization has, you know, 300 million people behind it. Um, so if you deploy, if you, if you run the DNS shop, you know, in, for a big ISP in India, um, with one decision, you're going to upgrade all your users, you know, hundreds of millions of users overnight. Um, same thing in the U.S., you know, the big cable companies control a huge portion of the, of the DNS work. So again, um, we're entering into an interesting phase where decisions by a very small number of people are able to influence um, privacy technology decisions at, at, at a, at a, on a massive scale, right? Browser operators, um, large ISPs, large centralized DNS uh, resolvers um, can make decisions which change the way things work on kind of a global basis. Um, and again, where, uh, what the motivations are for people doing those changes, um, I think is really important to keep an eye on that. Um, most of the time those, those decisions are made for commercial purposes. Um, Right now, engineers are still sliding things under the radar. You know, even in the big, in the big, you know, faceless organizations where where money is is running the show, there are still very good engineering decisions being made um, to that are in favor of the end user. But over time, uh, you got to watch out. You know, money tends to corrupt those decisions uh, in very subtle ways. So um, that's why I'm happy working for a not for profit. We. We get to be at least a little bit more um, uh, honest about what we see happening in the rest of the community um, than maybe some others have to be because of their their job security. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a really important point. Um, my friend who works for Linux Foundation has made comments before because he's had job offers that have uh, really offered him really high dollars. And because of where he used to work, he says, no, I got out of that world of doing yeah. things that really violated what I thought was not good engineering decisions um, in the face of trying to monetize uh, existence. I mean, so yeah, that's definitely, uh, it's important. Um, and it's a slow erosion. It's that you don't, like you said, you don't see it. It's that small chipping away at things that can lead to that. So, uh, and ultimately they're always going, how do we get more performance? The shareholders are always asking, how do we get more performance out of this company? How do we squeeze a few more dollars out? And they're like, yeah. Well, we have all this data over here. We could yeah. probably <laughs> repackage and sell it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I think there's there's less there's less insidious behavior occurring today than some people might think there is. Um, because honestly, I just don't think that there's been a lot of there hasn't been the focus on DNS as a marketing tool, except by a few organizations who are very sharp at that already. Um, the the risk is what happens in the future. Uh, where is the DNS going? What is it being used for? Will change over time. And so setting things up now with um, appropriate safeguards on the data itself, meaning encryption as an example, um, but then also structuring it with um, where you send your data, is it somebody you trust? Um, I think that's just as important. Um, but as I said, encryption is, is a big portion of that because now it becomes, instead of there being like unknown third parties in the stream, now you're starting to move towards a, you know, you have a relationship or you have a conscious relationship with the organization to whom you're giving your DNS data. And then that, that narrows the scope of how you, um, you enforce policy. And I, I think there's an incentive for your large com companies, and we'll say like, you know, the Facebook, Google, or even the Chinese uh, based ISPs and things like that. They have a vested interest in keeping it encrypted because it helps their security because most of the knowledge that they gain about their users, especially Facebook and Google, is the direct you know, knowledge you hand to them, the inputs right. you have on Facebook, right. the things you share on social media. And they have an interest in keeping that information for themselves because that's yeah. their gold. That's and, their oil. So, and, and honestly, the, you're you already are giving. You know, a company like Facebook is an example. When you're doing a query on a Facebook domain, you're already asking Facebook for that information. Right. <laughs> you no, know, you're not. There's nothing you can protect against. You know, 
face, Facebook in, in this particular example, right? You already, if you're doing a query on a Facebook domain, you're already giving them that data. So who yep. you're really concerned about is like, who are the other parties in the process that you're giving information about your Facebook queries? And it's not specific, it's not individual domains you should be more concerned about. It's the, it's the, it's the entirety of the DNS query set. And really the only people who have visibility into that right now are the recursive resolver operators, um, whether it's your ISP or whether it's, a, it's, it's someone like Quad9 in the middle, that's who you have to build the trust relationship with today. There are some interesting drafts uh, uh, occurring right now um, in the ITF again that are trying to split that out where um, things like Oblivious DNS or uh, that, that um, essentially break up your query into parts that neither, that actually you'd have to have two recursive resolver operators involved where neither of them understands who the user is and the other one doesn't understand what the query is. It's pretty complicated and fraught with um, fragility um, and actually somewhat slow, but it depends on how, how interested people are in this. And, and really the problem everyone's trying to solve is that trust problem. Like, do you trust who you give your DNS flow to? And, and trying to move to a zero trust model um, introduces it's, its own sets of, of problems. It, it's like the Tor model where it, handing it off and once you get you know three yep. nodes in removed, they don't know where it came from, they just know where to hand it to next. But that separation and the complexities of it, obviously, like you said, it creates a slowdown, it's a yep. fragile system. So yep. it's gonna D take a lot more th deep thinking to get this right. D DNS has worked astonishingly well for a very long time um, and it's, it's becoming more. It's becoming more complicated as a protocol because of the issues of trust, um, and and now the the layers of of things like encryption and uh, the eDNS extensions that are being added to DNS, which is which are I, I honestly quite useful and well overdue, um, but the complexity is increasing, and um, to operate a DNS server, a recursive resolver, um, is becoming more of a challenge and. That's one of the reasons I think a lot of people actually end up using something like Quad9 instead of running their own um, because, you know, just keeping up with the security releases is like, that's a, it's a big challenge these days and the new features and um, uh, various kinds of network uh, attacks that are occurring against the DNS servers themselves, but also against authoritatives, you know, you're, most organizations don't have time to think about DNS, right? It's just supposed to work. And the easiest way to make it work, like many services these days, is to outsource it to someone who only does that, right? Quad9 only does DNS. We know we, that's like 24 hours a day is all we do is <laughs> DNS. We don't do web hosting. We don't do email. We don't do any of these other things. So, and, and that's becoming a more reasonable decision for a company to make is to just say, all right, I, we, we can't deal with the volume of, of issues with this. Just get rid of it. We and still it completely makes sense. Yeah, we still encourage people to have a forwarding uh, cache at the edge of their organization because that improves speed dramatically. Uh, even if it doesn't do anything other than just answer your queries for your local customers and then send all of the queries to the, an external uh, upstream uh, recursive resolver. Um, it's, it's a huge win. And, we, and it also think, does things like it's a, it's a mix master for privacy. You never see the IP address of the clients. Uh, it translates between RFC 1918 addresses and a public IP address. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why affording uh, cash is a really good idea. And so we encourage that. But offloading the heavy lift of the recursive resolution to an outsource provider um, is, is, frankly, it's, it's the easiest thing to do and probably makes the most sense unless you have a really good tech staff or, or a, a well-written um, software package that auto-updates and things like that. You know, I know we've talked about um, PFSense, I'm a, I'm a big PFSense user. I think it's great. Um, that uses Unbound um, uh, as its core, great package. Um, but, that, but then you have to pay attention to your firewall or whatever it is that's doing those, those DNS uh, outbound requests as well. And in the most recent one, uh, what was that attack called uh, that was a fluff on Unbound that was recently patched in uh, PFSense? Um, it's another white paper. It's not a it's uh, not a real world one as much as it is a theoretical one that someone found where you could uh, have some improperly uh, improper DNS records to create a reflection attack. Uh, uh, well, yeah, there's, well, it's, it was an NS overloading NS records, uh, basically yeah. creating bogus NS records um, as a ver as a variant of attack that's actually been around for quite some time, and we noticed that a while back that it was resurging. Um, 
it, it actually isn't a theoretical attack. I mean, there, there, there are people using it, not at the scale oh. that they could have. Um, yeah. And, um, but pretty much all the DNS vendors patched for that in, on a, I guess a couple of weeks ago, I, I was yep. it, uh, a month ago now. Um, but, um, but yeah, pretty much most DNS vendors had some uh, uh, vulnerability to that. But that's the kind of thing that it would be really hard for you to, as, a, as an end user to keep up with. I mean, because right. that's, uh, but, but frankly, in the case of that attack, the risks were relatively low because it had to be someone able to recursively query your server. Most enterprises, the only people that can recurse to your server are your, are your employees. So you would have had to have somebody inside, you know, they're calling from in the house, right? You had to have right. someone behind the firewall doing this kind of attack and you would have been able to track them down. But so that, that's a good example, but these kind of things happen all the time. And there's all yep. these, and there's lots of security um, features that get added that are not as a result of papers, right? There's a lot of things that people kind of go, huh, you know, I wonder if you did this. And then everyone sits around and talks about it on an IRC channel or on, you know, sitting around at one of these DNS conferences and goes, you know, we probably should solve that and create a filter or a rule that fixes that before somebody else figures it out. So those kind of extensions are occurring all the time. And um, it, it's difficult for, for an organization to keep up with that unless you've got somebody who's really dedicated to DNS and, and managing that at the edge. So, yeah, no, it's, it's uh, definitely, push that update button and trust that really smart people wrote yeah. those, <laughs> wrote those patches yeah. for that. So that's definitely an issue. very interesting now. Yep. Yep. Um, so getting back to encryption. Um, uh, so as an example, again, PF sense unbound has the ability now to send queries using DOT um, from unbound out. And so actually I, I implemented that in mine quite a while ago. Um, very useful. It's not, it still needs some patches. It's not a really awesome implementation because um, it doesn't send, it doesn't pipeline queries particularly effectively. Um, so if you have a lot of queries, it's setting up and tearing down a TCP session for each one of those. Um, and, uh, but, but there is a lot of activity occurring now with things like there's a bunch of shim software out there like um, uh, the DNS crypt package is an example, which does DNS shimming for DOH. Um, uh, and I, I expect to see DOT or DOH included in pretty much every major resolver very soon now. It's included in a few of them and it's, it's, it's in discussion with everybody. So getting that encryption from the client to the, to the forwarding proxy or the forwarding cache and then the forwarding cache out to another forwarding cache uh, or another forwarder, that's, that's happening. And then from the recursive resolver to the authoritative's that that's closing down very quickly. And I, I really hope to see most DNS traffic encrypted within, well, I expect to see most DNS traffic encrypted from big resolvers in the next two years. It's gonna be a very, very long tail, like perhaps an infinite tail with getting things like IOT devices to encrypt their queries, which is, which is cause all the libraries out there, you know, they're all 10 years old and they're very stable but getting something like encryption and baked into your refrigerator's DNS stack is, it, it's a- It's not easy. It's a, it's a challenge, yeah, that's, um, that's a real challenge. And on a topic of like DNS over HTTPS, uh, how does that look in, on your side in terms of server load? Is that a, is that a more difficult challenge? Uh, I, I seen the Firefox roll out and they kind of stalled it back according to the Mozilla blogs. Uh, I wasn't really clear on why, but it sounded like they overloaded some of the servers that you were pointing it at. I, I don't, I don't know about that. Um, uh, I, I can't speak to that. Cloudflare was the one that's, that, that's yeah. the primary recipient for that traffic. I don't expect that Cloudflare was overloaded with um, HTTPS. I mean, that's, they're a CDN, so they, it sounded odd there. to me. I was actually just a little bit of reference. I was listening to it on uh, Steve Gibson on Security Now had a whole section of it because he's trying. He, had, he was asking the same question. Uh, he couldn't find a lot of inclusiveness other than some uh, Bugzilla reports of we're slowing down the rollout because it seems to not be resolving as fast, which was like well. So there's yeah. there's a difference between uh, overloading servers and there's a question of does adding a layer of, of HTTPS onto your DNS query slow things down? Right. And the answer to that still is a little unclear on the second part. I, I don't think that, I don't think that uh, HTTPS 
is a significant problem from a protocol perspective, meaning slowing servers down. The load introduced is really only on session startup. And then once you've got the session started, you, you keep it open for a while and you do a bunch of queries back and forth on the same socket. Um, so I don't think adding HTTPS is an overwhelming issue. Uh, we haven't seen it be significant. Okay. You know, it's, it's double digit percentages, but you know, is it 10% or 15%? Uh, it's, not, it's not massive. And actually there was someone who did a study on that and I'm sorry, I don't have the paper. I don't have my list of papers in front of me, but someone did actually a performance analysis. Um, and there have also been some comments made by, I want to say Deutsche Telekom in there. They, they've been doing some presentations. They're rolling out um, DNS over HTTPS in their network as well. Um, it's not massive. However, on the, on the HTTPS side of it, meaning the protocol itself, adding additional back and forth exchanges. Yes, that is the case. If you're not sending a lot of queries, you are adding additional packets. Um, you know, UDP DNS is incredibly simple. One query goes out, one response comes back. That's it. Yeah. Now, if you're adding, you know, a, a SYNAC, you know, a handshake on top of that, and if you're doing very few queries, meaning that your sessions are being closed and then reopened for every DNS query, yeah, it's going to be slower. Um, there are ways around that. Um, or there are ways, I shouldn't say there are ways around it, there are ways to mitigate that delay, uh, such as keeping your sessions open for longer, um, and, and so you don't have that handshake. Um, there are ways of pipelining queries, so you get multiple queries in a single request. Um, so uh, there was, again, there was some papers written on looking at the effectiveness of HTTPS. Is it actually better? Because retransmits are, are handled in a different way. Um, in other words, UDP DNS, when it skips, um, there's different delays that occur with how often you send a, a, a lost packet for being replied. And so under different packet loss circumstances, under different you know, latency circumstances, HTTPS might actually be better. Um, I would say that's going to be in fewer, but that's, a, that's my gut feeling. Um, <clears throat> does it add an appreciable delay? I I don't think it does right now. Um, and I think as, again, as these stacks get better, both on the recursive, uh, uh, the recipient side and on the transmission side, um, we'll see that improve further still. You know, DNS server quick is coming, um, which reduces the transaction load even further. So uh, I, don't, I don't think it would be an appreciable delta. There, there have been some papers which have said it's huge, I haven't seen that in practice. I mean, we've, I've, I've done tested. testing with it and didn't granted nothing actual, you know, benchmark wise, but just usage, turn it on, use it, see if I have any issues. Yeah. And I couldn't notice between going to uh, the browsers that were using it versus the browsers that weren't, I didn't notice anything about it. Um, but I, I imagine from an engineering standpoint, you look at it on paper, you see there are more packets going back and forth, but as you said, uh, proper, you know, speed servers that are close to you. Uh, it, it, it happens so fast. It kind of doesn't, it's not where the delay probably is opening up a web page. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it is, it is a minor portion, but of course, you know, you talk to the, to people who do web page performance design and, you know, 10 milliseconds is a big deal and, and rightfully so. But remember also a lot of these DNS requests are done um, all at the same time. So it's 10 milliseconds, but then that's divided out across however many DNS requests you have to do in the page. So, it turns into fractions of a millisecond slower. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I guess my comment is there are quite a few papers, some with contradictory information. Per, practically speaking, from my perceptions, I don't notice any difference. Um, your mileage may vary. Yeah. Um, so we're waiting on, we're waiting on a lot more research to come out as far as how it implements or how it affects rather the, um, uh, the implementations of Doe in each individual use case. So as an example, your recursive resolver might have a much lower perceived latency on a Doe stack than your browser might. So I have found from an administrative standpoint, uh, doing IT administration, it creates a, another challenging layer of, well, your computer can't resolve it. This application doesn't work, but your browser works great. Oh, yeah. you have a local DNS problem, but the DOH that you turned on in your browser, <laughs> Uh, yeah, with Firefox, yeah. So it's one more layer of troubleshooting. <laughs> so there's there's been a lot of fud thrown around about why ISPs are worried about Doe, and I, people think of it as in the following order: they think, "Oh, the ISP is sniffing my DNS and they're marketing it," and that's the primary reason that they're opposed to me using uh, an over-the-top 
provider like Quad9, that probably isn't the primary reason that they're scared. Um, that, is, that is on the list for some of them. Some of them might harvest your DNS data. A lot of them, most of them probably don't. Um, but again, that question of, well, are they interested? <laughs> now that it's been raised to their attention level, would they be interested in the future? So, um, but I think most of them are more terrified of just what you described, the support questions. Um, you know, a user calls in and says, I can't get to, you know, foo.com. Okay, well, you know, pull it up in your browser and it says failed, but when you type ping on a, in a command window, it works fine. Why is that? Well, right. your browser uses a different resolver. And what happens when each browser uses a different resolver or your, and your IoT devices use a different resolver than what your DHCP server is handing out? And you know, from a support perspective, that gets, that gets kind of worrying, um, <clears throat> which is getting back to one of my comments from much earlier in, this, in the conversation is, this is why we prefer DOT, um, although that preference is becoming less obvious over time. Because DOT is really, uh, it, it, the first thing to roll out DOT was Android, um, interestingly enough. Uh, again, Google's big organization, they have competing engineering issues yeah. sometimes. But Android Pi rolled out with auto upgrade for uh, DOT, meaning that if you are running on Android Pi and your DHCP server handed back to you an IP address that would respond on port 853, then Android would automatically upgrade and say, oh, great, encryption is available, let's use it, and it would. But it doesn't change the IP address to which you're connecting, meaning it doesn't change the policy arrangement with whoever your provider is. Um, so that's great, we think that's a fantastic way of doing it. And in fact, that's the way that Chrome is rolling out with DOH. Uh, it's slightly different in that the Chrome model says if we see that your system resolver is using an IP address that is in this list that we have um, of approved um, DOH servers, then we will automatically convert to DOH, meaning that they're not changing where your browser goes as far as DNS requests. They're simply changing the protocol. Okay. So they're looking at the operating system saying, well, what are you using? Oh, you're using, we, we, we recognize those guys. We'll change over to DOH, but the same destination. Nice. So that keeps at least a consistent policy. We think that's the great, we think that's the model to go with. Um, I didn't and, realize it was doing that. And I think that's yeah. important. Um, that completely makes sense. If you're already sending it to this uh, particular server, they just change the connection, but it definitely, yep. uh, I like yep. that. It, it's, it seems to make the most sense and it's the least surprising um, for that's a good point. The, 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 the principle of least surprise. <laughs> there um, <you> go. <laughs> and so uh, that's the way Chrome is doing it. And that's the way Android did it. And we think that's the way to go. Now, Windows has announced that they will be uh, in the future, uh, making all future versions of Windows support DOH at the system level. Um, we think that's a good idea. We actually really like that because that means that we're gonna to try to shift away again from each application doing its own DOH communication and move back to asking the operating system, you know, are you doing something encrypted? And you know, here's my DNS query, you go figure it out for me. Um, that's still, I believe, the right way to do things because it centralizes your DNS queries in a place that has well understood parameters and hopefully then is open to integration with vendors like antivirus vendors and other people who, who have a desire, a willing desire to put in filters and policy on the system level. So again, we think that, that when Microsoft's way of doing it is also the correct way where um, they're using DOH. At the moment, they have, um, and they're, I'm not even sure what they call it, I, I don't remember the name of it, but they're early, early beta prototype versions of this support. They have a fixed list um, just like Chrome does, where they have a list of approved DOH vendors. And if they see that the operating system, if they see the DHCP servers handing back an IP address, which maps to one of these approved DOH servers, then they will automatically upgrade the encrypt to an encrypted DOH session, DOH session. Both Chrome and Microsoft have said that that's an interim solution, that they hope to be able to do automatic upgrade based on policy, DNS-based policy, instead of having this hard-coded list with Quad9 and Cloudflare and Google in it, um, they hope to eventually migrate to a model that simply says, well, if, the, if there is a trusted DOH service offered by that IP address, then we'll switch over. So um, 
that's the way it's going to progress over time. We're still kind of in, in the introductory um, uh, stumbling steps of how to do automatic discovery and upgrade of DNS. DOH is a little bit more challenging than uh, DOT. Um, and uh, DOT, because DOT uses a specific port number, it's very easy to figure out if you should upgrade because you should just say, all right, this is the IP address D DHCP gave me. Let's try connecting at port 853 and do a query. Oh, it succeeds, but upgrade the connection. DOH is much tougher because DOH, uh, of course, operates on port 443. So um, all kinds of things can be served on port 443. What's the URL? Is there really a DOH server running there? Also, DOH operates on names. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't use IP addresses. You, you typically give a name a name to a DOH server. So you're going to say my my DOH server is dns.quad9.net. Well, okay. Now you have this bootstrap problem. I have to look up dns.quad9.net in order to connect to dns.quad9.net. So how does that work? So um, how the certs work? How you do? How do you trust answers in a pre-trust environment? That's that's where everyone is right now and trying to figure that out. Yeah, that the bootstrapping is a little bit of a problem on there because I think someone had said one of the methodologies that some of the filtering companies uh, like that make enterprise IT filtering to stop people from doing that is breaking the bootstrap process so they can mm -hmm. sinkhole it before it starts. Therefore, people still have to go through whatever uh, filtering policies exist on that uh, business or corporate network. Yeah, well, Doe just kind of blows that out of the water. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> because a DOE server can be any system that supports DOH, right? Or that supports TLS. So yeah. you can't tell, <clears throat> excuse me, you can't tell that a server is a DOH server unless you know something about it. And so it is possible to disguise your DOH queries in the same stream of traffic as your normal web queries. So um, that's, I mean, DOH is a great protocol, but from a policy perspective, it's somewhat worrying. Um, and we support it, by the way. So I'm, I'm saying this out of two sides of my mouth, right? We support yeah. DOH, but at the same time, it's a little bit scary because it, when, when it is possible for every web browser to automatically and by default be a VPN, um, that is going to cause some backlash from organizations, enterprise in particular, um, that are trying to manage the destinations to which their employees connect for, for very legitimate reasons for both malware distribution and, and security issues, but also just from filtering perspective. There are, there are reasonable conditions under which filtering can be applied. There are unreasonable conditions under which filtering can be applied, but it is impossible to tell the difference between reasonable and unreasonable. Um, and so DOH makes it so that um, even people who, even organizations who want to be cooperative are going to be forced to be uncooperative and they're going to be forced to put in what we would probably think of draconian measures to prevent um, DOH from, from undermining their security model. Um, so I expect, unfortunately, I expect DOH to drive um, a, a rather sharp increase in um, disconnection from the internet, um, uh, meaning end-to-end -end disconnection from the internet and forcing users in enterprises and in, in some cases in entire countries um, to be put through proxying servers, which unwrap every single query and examine it in detail because uh, that's the only way to enforce any policy is to unwrap all packets. So preventing uh, preventing end-to-end -end because it's now it's now the case that VPNs are so omnipresent that you can't trust any traffic. If you're a, if you're a network operator, you can't trust any traffic to be non-malicious because you can't see it. So that's my concern with DOH. Um, Quad9 um, has, we, we've, we've committed to not running any other services or any other content on our IP addresses which contain DOH servers. This is kind of a, a, a bone we're throwing to enterprise and, and in some cases, uh, national governments who say, well, um, DOH is dangerous. We can't, we can't block port 443 um, or, we, or maybe we can block port 443, but we don't want to. 
So we've said, all right, we're operating our DOS servers on a very small set of IP addresses. And the only thing that's on those IP addresses is DNS. So if you want to block quad nine, you know, that's your right to do so. We can't prevent you from doing that. If we try to be clever and, you know, distribute our, our DOS servers across a lot of different random IP addresses, we're only putting fuel on the fire of, of people ultimately disconnecting their users from the internet. And we're not interested in that. So we're saying, all right, if you want to block quad nine, here are the set of IP addresses that we operate on. Block us at an IP level. You know, it's, it's then up to your end users to complain to the administrators as to why they can't get, you know, a open DNS resolution, but that's not, uh, you cannot solve a policy problem with technology. Very it does true. not work. <laughs> no. It doesn't work. And the more you try to force a policy solution with technology, the more you'll discover that other policies are layered on top of the technology, which ultimately, you know, somebody with a gun solves that problem, right? You know, ultimately laws or not necessarily a gun, but like if you're an enterprise, your enterprise operator is just going to say, you know what? We can't trust any of you. <laughs> We'd like to, but we can't trust any of you. So we're going to disconnect everyone from the internet. Um, and you're all going to go through this filtering proxy. And that's the way it's, that's the way it's going to be. There's no more end to end. And we think that that's, that's not a good result. DOT allows per port blocking. So if you wanted to block quad nine DOT, you simply block port 853. Right. Easy, right? You don't have to block end to end for the whole internet. You can just block port 853 and you solve the problem mostly. Um, uh, you know, it, the, the question of is this, is this, um, is the death of the internet, you know, details at 11, is, is, this, uh, is, this, is this a little bit premature? Yeah, it is. We're not going to see that, you know, in the next year or two years. Five years? Maybe. And is DNS really going to be the reason for this? No, probably not the only reason. But we would like it not to be a contributing factor. Um, at least here at Quad9, we would like it not to be a contributing factor, yeah. which is why we're... We're bigger fans of DOT, but you know the cat's out of the bag right now. DOH is happening. Um, it's happening at scale. It's not just going to be Quad9. Obviously, it's not already. Um, and it's not going to even just be the centralized DNS providers. It's going to be malware operators. It's going to be small ISPs. It's going to be all these open resolvers, which already kind of litter the internet, which are unmanaged and, and out there for various good or bad reasons. Um, so... Um, Pandora's box is open. Um, we can only try to encourage good behavior, but we cannot, we can't compel it. Um, we'll see with how this plays out in the next, in the next five years. Yeah, uh, an interesting thing that we haven't seen yet, but this, like you said, opening up new opportunities <clears throat> is we've seen malware that hijacks routers, that hijacks uh, computers and changes where their DNS queries go. Um, mm -hmm. Wow, how, how much uh, more fun can it be when a browser, but the operating system itself has just decided to use something else? How do we, yeah. uh, as an IT provider, how do we defend against it? Because we're going, I don't know why you keep going to this website because I ping it from the command line and it goes here. Oh, look, yeah. something hijacked where yeah. your DOH goes. So it's going to, yeah. going to be interesting. <clears throat> yep. Um, yeah. And so filtering used to be easy just by blocking certain ports. You could block, mm -hmm. you know, most of the threats. Like if you block port 53, you could restrict your DNS just to a local resolver, which had some policy applied to it. Great. Um, I can't really do that anymore. It's becoming, uh, it's becoming very, very difficult, if not impossible. Um, uh, side note, actually, this, this might interest you again, because I know a lot of your users and, and uh, are, are using PFSense. One of the things that I, I suggested a while back was, wouldn't it be great if your firewall uh, and I'm sure somebody is already doing this. So I'm going to get like the first comment you're going to be is, oh, so-and-so has this implementation already. <laughs> but wouldn't it be great if your firewall did not allow connections to IP addresses for which there was not a recent DNS query, which resulted in an A or quad A record? That seems like a reasonable thing, right? If, you're, if, you're, if your laptop tries to connect to a raw IP address that has never had a DNS query associated with it, why is that, right? What, what's actually doing that? Um, because Quad9 is a filtering DNS service, um, we protect you against domains that are known to be bad. 
All right, so that gets, that gets a pretty good percentage of, of malware and phishing sites and all kinds of other stuff, but it doesn't get all of it. Um, and, and in fact, it, it might not even get the majority, but it gets a good portion. Um, because still a lot of malware uses IP addresses, it just opens up a connection to some random IP address out there. Um, wouldn't it be useful to be able to stop your system from connecting to IP addresses unless it had done a DNS query. In other words, unless it had validated a domain against one of a blocking DNS service like Quad9. Um, so I actually had somebody write a, uh, a module for uh, PFSense that looked at the unbound logs on PFSense and, and dug through them in real time, essentially within a few milliseconds and said, all right, if a query goes to unbound, meaning the local resolver in PFSense, and then PFSense resolves it, whether through actual recursive resolution or through a query out to a forwarding resolver like Quad9, a response comes back and it's valid, right? A, a real IP address. Then a firewall rule would be inserted to allow that, that client to connect to that IP address. And if there wasn't a DNS lookup, you, you wouldn't be able to connect outbound. Um, so I had someone write this module and honestly, it took a long time for the module to get written and it took like five months and uh, kind of lost momentum on it. But I think I put it up on, did I put it up on GitHub? I think I did. Oh, great, I can leave a link to, uh, below if you can. I, if it's not on GitHub, I'll publish it. Um, All right. <laughs> I, don't remember, I don't remember what we did with it, but um, it sort of kind of worked. It was still a little bit buggy and uh, we just lost, I honestly lost traction with it because of the delays and we got focused on other stuff. Um, but that seems like a really useful thing to be able to say DNS is a prerequisite for connectivity out of my firewall. Um, I think it would be a really interesting, uh, when you're trying to find indicators of compromise, it should be something that sets off flags and encourages investigation. Might be a good way to, from a debugging standpoint too, look at what gets flagged. Because there's probably, especially as you, if we were to deploy this in a larger scale network, I would probably find not necessarily always nefarious, but probably a lot of stupid things <laughs> and yep. IoT devices that's decided to hard code some IP address. But those are still interesting uh, dives into what might be going on. And of course, like you said, in terms of indicators of compromise or potential malware, that is common that they just go right out because they don't want to trigger any of these sinkholing filters. They're going to yep. go uh, call out right to an IP address. Yep. So, so yeah, that's have, interesting. If anybody that's interested in working on that, um, we're interested in applying it. It's really, it's not a, it's not a quad nine, it's not, it's not specific to Quad9, it was specific no. to PFSense. Um, it was kind of a proof of concept, but it would, it would certainly improve the effectiveness of a DNS filtering service of any type, whether you run one locally or whether you use Quad9. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so there's, there's uh, lots of interesting things happening right now in the DNS field. Um, encryption is, is certainly a challenge, um, uh, but as I said, the long tail is gonna be very, very long um, again, yes. with different things, you know, DNS as an unencrypted protocol is going to take 20 years to go away um, or more. I mean, I still I have, I probably have 12 or 13 year old equipment. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I've got, I've got 13 year old equipment just sitting right here on the table um, that I'm configuring as new um, for, for stuff. Um, got a, one of these, one of these uh, rack bots. Oh, environmental sensors. Um, I use them for temperature and humidity, but I was looking at the firmware as, you know, 2007. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not going to support it. Yeah. That's, that's not going to support the new protocol. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely going on a VLAN all by itself, but it can't talk to the outside world. Um, but those kind of things, you know, we, these devices are going to be around. And in fact, we still see people using ancient versions of windows and, and Mac OS. That's it's going to take forever to get up to encryption uh, standards. So. Here in the Detroit area, um, you know, due to the manufacturing, there's a ton of uh, manufacturing equipment. Um, matter of fact, many of the large, the very large supplier here just outside of Detroit that does um, cabinet manufacturing still runs OS2 Warp. And their answer is it ain't broke. It, yeah. Good news is it's so old, it's offline, so it's safe. Yeah, that's, the, <laughs> it's, you know, the safest machines are the ones encased in Lucite. So yeah. uh, you know, OS, <laughs> OS2 is essentially encased in Lucite at this point. But yep. um, yeah, I mean, that's... It, DNS encryption is going to do great things for, um, I think, the vast majority of people because, again, these updates and, um, you know, a browser vendor or an operating system vendor can push things out to hundreds of millions of end users in a week. Um, and that solves the vast majority of the problems. And that's, I think, really what we're trying to deal with. You know, how, how much of the Internet can we give better privacy and security and, and a higher level of trust? Um, 
And that's what I think everybody in this industry is working towards. There's always gonna be that long tail. Um, interesting studies about how long it's gonna take for rollouts for ISPs, right? ISPs who have uh, D DNS mask is another um, program that's used quite frequently in embedded systems. So a lot of European uh, ISPs have DNS mask embedded in the home router so that it acts as a, as a forwarding cache. Great, and speeds up queries. But, uh, you know, interval to upgrade you know, they're talking like, well, minimum, minimum is five years. Maximum is never. <laughs> like yeah. we, just, we don't even know what's out there. We don't know how to upgrade it. We don't, you know, those companies have gone out of business, so we don't even have the firmware. <clears throat> I mean, it's going to yeah. take a very long time for this to happen. Yeah. There's it, no one replaces the cable modem until the consumer complains about it. And then they go, Oh wow. That thing still worked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so the hope is not lost, but it's, no. it is going to be on, you know, it's going to be a lot of this is going to be on the end user to, to up, update their settings. More frequently though, it's going to be the small IT, you know, the, if you're a big company, it's the IT administrator in your office, or if you're a small company, it's the IT administrator for the whole company. They're the ones who are going to be able to make the most change the fastest by changing some just a few components of how they do their networking, you know, install a forwarding cache locally in the network and then send all your queries out encrypted to quad nine, right? Or yep. uh, in install a local recursive resolver that's doing DOH to end users and then send your, requ your queries out to the roots, however you want to do it. But it's, it's, it's going to be difficult to get this rolled out to um, all the edges um, uh, completely, but we can make a big difference um, with some of these new protocols and, and methodologies pretty quickly. One server at a time. That's uh, one, yeah. one little piece at a time. We'll get there. Yeah. Well, this is great. All right. What other questions do you have? I'm, I'm full of, um, <laughs> of long-winded answers. I know. I think we've covered uh, the bases. We got, you know, who Quad9 is, we, why DNS is uh, important to be encrypted, how hard it's going to be encrypted, and, uh, and what can just individuals do besides switching to it? I mean, I mentioned before in a, in a tweet that there's a donate button on top. So, I mean, if you, every, every couple of dollars helps. Please do. Um, <laughs> yes, as you said, it's a uh, underfunded operation, much like all nonprofits. Uh, keep this private because they offer a free DNS service, but not free as in you're the product, free as in because people uh, take the time to throw money at them. <laughs> yep. So. Yep. Our goals are the end user's goals, which is very different than pretty much everybody else. Um, yeah. Which means that you eat a lot of ramen noodles. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that is how it works, but it's a, uh, it's a labor of love for sure. I yep. see you have a lot of passion for it. Well, thank you for joining and And uh, you can find out everything. Just uh, hit quad nine uh, bus place to find quad everything about quad nine.net. So, all right. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Bye. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.